All right. Well, we have um, Barbara Micheletti who's joining us today and you all are in for a treat. I'm excited for her to uh, pass over the mic here and for her to share a little bit more about her background, but she is the, um, the founder and CEO of Interrupting Aging. So I'm going to pass it on over before I try to take, take the wind out of her sail and let her share a little bit more about what she does and her background uh, for an aging population. Over to you. Well, thank you, Lauren. I really appreciate the offer and the opportunity to be here. So I wanted to thank you for that. Yeah. I don't know if you want to start off with why my why story or where you wanted to go from here. Yeah. Let's go ahead and just start there because I feel like hearing a little bit more about your background, how you got into the space, um, why you founded this company. Tell me a little bit more. Well, it started off back in 1998 when I became a gerontologist. Mm -hmm. Now, I explain often what a gerontologist is after 26 years of being one. It simply means we studied the aging body mm -hmm. from midlife, from the whole lifespan, but we focus on older and elderly people and what they go through and the experience their life experiences. So I like to say I love to help people love growing older is what I like to say that I do. But also... It also started off a little bit tumultuously when I started my insurance career. So let me give you a little history on that. Okay. Back in 2006, uh -huh. I started off as an insurance agent where I opened my insurance agency. Mm -hmm. I literally went from being a stay-at-home mom the one day to the next day becoming this insurance agency owner and a franchise owner with yeah. a company called Brook Corporation. Mm -hmm. Now, this journey was very challenging in that right after I started my insurance company with zero clients, zero clients back in the day, I built that up from 2006 to 2008 and even one use of a company car. Mm -hmm. In 2008, I experienced extremely challenging circumstances where not only I was a franchise owner of Brook Corporation, where Brook Corporation committed right. investor fraud. And they were sentenced and they went bankrupt in 2008 and they subsequently went to court and all that through the Securities and Exchange Commission. But I also experienced personal financial betrayal from my ex-spouse while we were going through a divorce. Wow. And it took me a long time to understand and to grasp the depth and the severity of that financial devastation. Mm -hmm. now, now, I tell you this because what I gained from that, and you like to think about it as, uh, you know, how Nietzsche said, what doesn't kill us makes us stronger, but yeah. also how a diamond is forged from intense pressure. Well, I like to think that that's where I came from. Mm -hmm. And that's why I do what I do today and why I'm such a big advocate, especially for women mm -hmm. in this space. What that taught me and what I bring to my clients today is it taught me resilience, mm -hmm. how to be resilient in the face of absolutely adverse circumstances where you have no choice but to commit to a path and to follow that path. So it taught me that resilience. It taught me crisis management yeah. because literally that year as Brook Corporation went bankrupt, they literally dropped every single franchise owner. And there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of us. Mm -hmm. But as I went through my own personal financial betrayal right. in my own family dynamic, I had to take that whole crisis management onto a new level and right. learn, learn how to navigate not only personally, but professionally. So what did I do? I was able to contact every single client that I had mm -hmm. and let them know that this is what happened. So I was very transparent and very right. honest with them, letting them know this is what happened. I'm regrouping as another company called B&B &B Insurance Agency, mm -hmm. and I'm going to bring you over to this new company. Then I contacted back then it was 11, 11 insurance carriers. And I reached out to them. They knew exactly what was going on because a lot of them lost money too, right? Mm -hmm. Because premiums were kept by this corporation. So they right. lost a lot of money. So they were happy that I was able to have that resilience and can go through this crisis management and commit to the strategic problem solving right. by taking all these clients and bringing them over and putting them right back into their policies. So right. every single client followed me, every single insurance carrier took me back. Mm -hmm. So that taught me how to quickly adapt. And it taught me the value of transparency and 
being a fiduciary to your clients. Yeah. And that's what brought me to where I'm at today, talking with my clients, helping my financial professionals, the insurance professionals to be that fiduciary, to demonstrate the transparency and the integrity with their clients. So they in turn will trust them to know what and do the right thing for them. Mm -hmm. I think so much what you talked about is so much in the heart of entrepreneurship, right? Like grit, tenacity, being able to work under extreme pressure, you know, keep that smile, right? It's that, that yeah. perseverance that um, sometimes it's always like people see the surface of the, uh, you know, they, 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 they see the top, but they don't see everything else that's going on underneath. So, you know, you okay. I think sharing that it brings to light some of these I think real um, challenges that we go through, but they kind of thicken our skin, especially if you go to, you know, start your own venture or you're, it's going to thicken your skin somewhere along the way to be able to have that stamina. So tell us a little bit more, you know, you talked a lot about um, you worked in the financial services space, you know, how a little bit of how you got here and you're working currently with an aging population. You talked about fiduciary. I know um, there's a component to really listen to your clients. Tell us a little bit more about why this demographic um, and what you're doing to help others. I think mostly in the, is it mostly in the wealth management and insurance space support this audience? Can you share a little bit more about that and kind of what this audience looks like when we say aging demographics? So I know that's a lot of questions there, but I'd love to to kind of unpack that a little bit more. And that's okay. We could just, we can dive right into that. So the reason I chose the aging population is because of that gerontology background. And again, gerontology simply means aging, that we're all aging. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing. We are living in this rapidly aging population. We're living to age 100 really is this new normal. When right. you do a, a Monte Carlo they often advise the advice, the financial professionals use age 100 as that benchmark. So we, and, and I can say as yeah. an as aging expert, as a gerontologist, yeah. we are living in an aging population. Mm -hmm. So aging population, and you and I, Lauren, talked about this off, offline here for a few minutes, and I'll talk about what that means quickly. So an aging population is, to be clear, we are aging the minute we're born. We don't start aging at 40 or at right. 65. We don't right. become old. We're aging throughout our entire life. We just don't think about it until we start developing physical pains or right. maybe a mental cognitive pain, or our employer tells us now we're a federally protected workplace employee because I have that insurance background, right. um, business insurance background, that we're a federally protected employee at the age of 40. Mm -hmm. So our society has a bit of a challenging time when it comes to what our age is and what an aging population. But from a financial planning perspective, we do want to focus on our financial professionals helping people of all ages financially plan. Okay. And what so what brought me in yes. was the gerontology. And then the other story I'll share with you, another one of my why stories is when I was that insurance agent, I had regrouped my company, BNB Insurance, and then I sold it to a national brokerage and I became a top producing salesperson, a commercial salesperson for that organization. So it was during my tenure as a business insurance advisor that I can't tell you, Lauren, how many clients I helped, not only with their commercial insurance portfolio, but with their personal aging issues as well. Mm -hmm. And some of the most devastating ones were the cognitive impairments that I was able to step up as a gerontologist and help my clients with. That in part helped me transition over. I made the decision I couldn't help them as just an insurance agent, it right. ultimately led me to where I'm at today. Okay. So just to take a step back and sorry for, this is the, maybe a little bit of the marketer in me. Cause I'm like, okay, I want to narrow it a little bit more. And I know, and I, and I can understand the definition too of, right. We're, we're aging all throughout our lives, but is there a particular demographic that you're primarily focused on? Like ages 40, to 60 or to 80 that you really kind of zero in on when you're working with these professionals. Do you mind sharing a little bit more on that side? I do. And that's a very good question because I do focus on those age 40 and above. Mm -hmm. We'd like to see the financial planning happen in people's twenties and thirties for sure. But when we hit age 40, that's when we start developing chronic diseases. Oftentimes we can hit them in our thirties. Women, we develop a thyroid impairment in our thirties which is very typical for us, which in, now that's considered a chronic disease. So we develop, we start developing as a whole, men and women, 
chronic diseases in our 40s. Financially preparing for this aging issue and our financial planning, we want to focus on those age 40 and above. And thinking about not only our financial planning and that retirement goal that we have, but also thinking about what are these future aging, current and future aging issues that we have. Mm-hmm. Okay. Develop. So then in kind of furthering that definition, 40 and above, you had alluded to health issues, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and you had also talked about uh, in earlier folks that have kind of these mental issues. It, mental um, stop gaps as they're as they're aging. So, like, what kind of uh, how do I say? Like, what kind of uh, challenges are you pulling apart? Just maybe some examples, like you had, like the health issues. What other conversations are you having uh, to help individuals, or really maybe to help advisors or insurance agents um, work with these individuals through these kind of quote unquote aging issues? So, one of the aging issues you brought up is the cognitive issue. What is the what of the most devastating diseases that any of us could face is developing Alzheimer's. Mm-hmm. So there's the dementia as an umbrella. If you think of, de- of dementia as an umbrella term, and right. under the umbrella term, you can have Alzheimer's. You can have Lewy body dementia. You can have frontotemporal dementia. Uh, so those are some of the more, I say, popular ones. Alzheimer's by far is the most um, is the most widespread. And Mm -hmm. unfortunately, we women of the 6 million plus people, it could be close to 7 million people now, who live in the United States with Alzheimer's, two-thirds are women. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely a future aging issue that we want to think about from a financial perspective. So for the financial professional to have their conversation with a single woman or a single man or a couple that conversation absolutely wants to come up. Have you financially prepared for the the, the chance? It's abnormal aging. It's not normal. Right, we all right. don't develop that. But have you thought about if this happens to you, will your spouse be your caregiver? It could be the husband as well. It's just yes. more women develop this. So to have a financial plan, have a conversation yeah. in advance, not when you start seeing signs. And even if you do start seeing those red flags of a cognitive impairment, which financial decision making is one of the first to go, Mm -hmm. then have that conversation as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So then are you coaching advisors and folks in the insurance space on how to have these conversations and then also how to listen for these things so that they can support best support their clients? Is that is that really the engagement? Exactly. Listen and look. Mm -hmm. So I like to see you can, I like to tell my clients, financial and insurance professionals, asset managers, bankers, you name it, that you are an ideal set of eyes and ears for your clients because they see them on somewhat of a regular basis, whether it's annual, whether it's every six months, but you can see physically how they are acting if their body is is you know all our bodies i mean we're just we're just breaking down over decades right as we right, as right. we age right. if we're lucky to get into old age yeah. our body just simply breaks down this is just our natural aging process some people's bodies break down even more so mm-hmm. sometimes when our bodies break down it can also trigger a cognitive issue a brain issue mm-hmm. so that's something that financial professionals could look with their eyes and with their ears so getting to know their clients, really understanding their clients, right. very similar to how a coach understands yep. his, his or her players, yep. very similar to that for financial professionals to really understand their clients. Yep. And that way you can better predict future behaviors yep. of their clients. Helping them and help be a them. better coach. That makes exactly. sense. Yeah. Exactly. So then, okay. So this is probably also the marketer hat in me. So, right. So once you start to be able to really like know what to pick up on, right? Those nuances or the things like you said, you look and you listen. A lot of times you think about creating an experience that really helps to optimize it for that particular demographic. Do you also work with with advisors, insurance agents on like creating, you know, updating maybe their their onboarding process that better serves that audience or meeting frequencies or maybe even like a gifting strategy or 
outreach approach? Like what, what is your involvement on that part of it to make sure that people are, are heard how they want to be heard? I think that's such a great question because as with any relationship, right, we want to be as authentic as we can be. We want to be as transparent as we can be as we get to trust that other person. So as the financial, the insurance professionals, the asset managers, the bankers, yep. any money, any money expert, they want to have this type of candid conversation with their client to say, look, we're playing on the same team. You know, right. My job here is to understand as much as I can to help you to have this long-term relationship with you and to understand your, you know, your family dynamic, to understand what you're, what you're looking for as you mm -hmm. age with your money. What, what are your values? What do you values? Right. And understanding that these can change with time because we humans, we change with time. We evolve, we meet yep. new people, we yep. form new opinions. We digest more information and it changes how we how we integrate this new information with what our existing information is. And we come to different conclusions. Family dynamics can break down. Relationships can break down. Mm -hmm. Bodies can break down. So it's such an ideal spot for this money professional to be able to start the conversation with their client. Having that transparency saying to the, to the client, let's be candid. I want to help you and I'm here to help you. And when you're letting me know what's going on in your life, I can better help you plan not only for now, but for your future from a holistic financial yep. planning approach, not just a traditional. And that's not to say we need to throw out the baby in the bathwater, traditional financial planning, asset protection, mm -hmm. investment, because I did take my Series 65 and, and the, S, the securities industry exam, I was going to become that financial advisor until I became this consultant. But having the traditional yeah. financial planning process in place along with holistic financial planning, look at people as a whole human mm -hmm. as they age and, and encompassing their aging process, their health, their mental health, physical health, their family dynamic, their legacy, what you talked about, what kind of legacy do they want to leave? you know, what inheritance, the estate planning, mm -hmm. all those things. Yeah. So helpful. Um, th th there's a lot to cover. Right. And I mm -hmm. also really appreciate what you talked about earlier too, of there's not like a formulate process, right? You have to be able to be nimble and adjust as individuals are moving, but being able to have that thinking and to be able to know how to listen and to, to look and listen, as you said earlier, I think is, um, it's a, it's a real tool, right? There's an art and all of that. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I but but yes. to your point, to your point, you can. So we talk about having a system. We talk about having a repeatable process. Right. right. And especially if we're in the RIA space you know, or a broker dealer. But I but I know your your audience is more of an RIA space. You can create a repeatable, easily repeatable process with this, yep. because while we while we humans are very unique and it's very personal and that's why it's called personal financial planning, right. we can create a repeatable process mm -hmm. with when we're talking to every single client, no matter they're a solo aging woman or a man right. or a couple or a suddenly single person yeah. Yeah. where women live longer. So they're often more on the single side than men. We can create a an easily repeatable process for this. That's I wanted right. to speak that in. It's so true. If you have the repeatable process that be it, you know, it takes out some of that thinking that's been done, right? But then it's mm -hmm. it's paired with that human side and that that touch. Exactly. That, yeah. yeah. There's exactly. Yeah. Okay, so I just want to be mindful of time. This is helpful to be able to I appreciate you unpacking some of this, sharing a little bit more about your background. Because you have had so many conversations with um, you know, different folks, you've really helped them to listen and learn. Are there any key things that you feel like, gosh, if just the general population knew more about, I don't know, maybe fraud related issues or um, caring for their loved ones, uh, you know, kind of like what to expect, you know, and, you know, kind of thinking forward about that. Are there themes that you often see that come up? And I'm just asking because these might be conversations that could turn into webinar topics for, you know, for advisors or for, for insurance agents, or they could be partnership opportunities or what have you, and things that would be helpful for, um, you know, for, for this, for, for an aging population to know about. Well, you touched upon one of my, 
my, I, I say favorite topics, but because of what I experienced earlier in my career, well, at the beginning of my insurance career back in 2006 forward was financial fraud. I saw the investor fraud. I saw the, you know, the, the personal right. fraud. Right. So because of that, and here's, here's another thing we didn't, I didn't tell you until right now, back when I was in graduate school and I had no idea that I was pre, pre predetermining my future yeah. back in graduate school, when I was in my early thirties, I was an older student, mm-hmm. my at gerontology graduate school, and I took marketing as a minor because I always loved business. Mm-hmm. I chose senior financial fraud as my thesis. So I talked about and I wrote about all those years ago telemarketing fraud, mm-hmm. mail fraud, mm-hmm. senior fraud. Still I was goes working on. In, still yep. goes on. And the numbers were horrible back then. And I had experienced it when I worked in a bank back then uh, with a client. And it just it just struck me so much. So I resurrected that research I did back in 1998, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. And I updated it with current numbers back in 2021 when I really was getting this business going and the numbers frightening. So I created a national presentation that I call the wolf who ate grandma Mm -hmm. and it's on senior financial fraud. And I am part of a a senior financial fraud mastermind group where Mm -hmm. we are presenting to government entities. We've presented already to uh, there's the elder justice and the department of justice. So I'm very honored to be with that group of, of colleagues that I'm with there, but fraud is something that's very near and dear to my heart. It happens all the time. Yep. It's everywhere all the time. And it's something that financial professionals really want to deeply uh, inv- learn more about along with the aging issues yes. of older people, because there are certain things that we go through in our aging process that sometimes increases the likelihood of being financially frauded. Yep. It's so true. And it's such a scary thing. And I feel like it's one of those things where you've got to learn about it before it happens, you know, not after the fact. So um, exactly. And the caregiving that you spoke of the caregiving, that's such an intimate component with that as well, because if you're a couple, you know, you've got, you, you got that financial fraud, that is a possibility, but when you're a couple or when you're by yourself, you could be caring for an adult child or something, but the caregiving is another untold. There's so many caregivers. The numbers are staggering. The number of people that I meet, I meet a lot of men, believe it or not, who are caregivers, and we don't talk about them as much, and I wish we did. 40, 40% of U.S. men mm-hmm. in the United States, U.S. men, are caregivers, mm-hmm. but we don't talk about that. So caregiving is a huge financial piece that financial professionals can talk to their clients about, are you a caregiver now? Will you be a future caregiver to your spouse, to your mom, your dad, your grandma, your grandpa? Yes. Oh my goodness. There's so much to unpack just as you're talking about this. I feel like um, I can see that there's a, there's a lot to learn. So, and I think that, you know, as we kind of talked about in the beginning, sort of that definition of aging, right? It's important to learn this. I think even before it becomes a quote unquote issue. Um, so that that education is really key. And I feel like um, financial advisors in particular are in such a place to be able to be a, um, to have a stage to be able to share that. And so it's really a, a a place that they can help to further empower individuals. So I appreciate you sharing a little bit more about your insights and working with this demographic. So um, Barb, thank you again. We'll make sure to include a link to your website uh, with more details. Thank you so much, Lauren.